1,153 billionaires in the world. 2,153 billionaires in the world. Their wealth combined is about $8.7 trillion. 607 of those billionaires live in the United States. 14 of the top 20 billionaires in the world live in the United States. 40% of those 607 billionaires that live in the United States live in two different states. Any guesses? California and New York. Of those that live in California and New York, 75% of those live in two different cities. Any guesses? New York City, San Francisco. Anyone know who the youngest self-made billionaire is in the United States? Hmm? What'd you say? Yes, Kylie Jenner. Cosmetics. Yep, 21 years old. I haven't made my first million yet, and here she sits at 21, a self-made, with help from mom, billionaire. That's a lot of money, if you think about it. Recently, and this is not a political statement, so don't take this as a political message this morning. Recently, a presidential hopeful stated that he intended to eliminate all billionaires. Anybody know who that was? Bernie. How much is Bernie worth? A lot. Okay. The plan is a progressive wealth tax that for the wealthiest would top out an 8% tax. Just for being wealthy, we'd tax you 8%. It would cut the billionaires worth by 50% in 15 years. How much money is that? If you took just U.S. now, if you took the top 15 billionaires in the United States, their value is about $1 trillion. Keep this in perspective. You take billionaire number 16 all the way down to 50, their worth is about $1 trillion. If you took billionaire number 51 and go all the way down to billionaire 125, their net worth is about $1 trillion. Then if you take billionaires from 125 all the way to about 400, is worth about $1 trillion. There's a lot of money there. If you take the top 1% of the wealthy in the United States, the top 1%, so this is beyond billionaires, the value, according to U.S. News and World Report, is about $30 trillion, the top 1%. It's a lot of money. Again, this is not a political message. This is a message about what does the Bible say about the wealthy. We're going to be in James 5, 1 through 6 this morning. And I can give you a second there to turn to that if you like. But I'm going to read it real quick. It's not that long. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and the corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heap, heaped up treasure in the last days. Verse 4, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. And that's what we're going to be covering this morning from James 5. He's, James starts off uh, pretty aggressively here as he says, Come now. A uh, more direct translation is, Listen now. Attention. He's talking to a specific group of people, most likely unbelievers, but most likely associated with the church. These are people that in some way or another claim or profess to be Christians. They're somehow associated with the church, but they're not. We, we know if, we, if you look at the book of James, he's, he's showing evidence of being a believer, not things that make you a believer or make you a Christian. 
So he's really getting a hold of these people. And he's, you rich, these are people who had put their arrogant trust in things that were doomed to decay. And he's talking to this audience. He says, weep and howl. This is a command. He's telling them, just start weeping and howling now. That word uh, weep is kleio, which means to sob out loud or lament. It's like the wailing that takes place when someone dies. Think how aggressive that is when there's that loss and you're crying out. Or another way to translate it would be burst into tears and howl with uncontrollable grief. I think of my uh, wonderful grandsons that uh, live with us right now. And it doesn't take much for them to just start wailing in uncontrollable grief and crocodile tears. And it's like the world has, their world has come to an end. And it could be the smallest little thing like it's time to go to bed. Oh, the humanities. And they're just devastated. And the crocodile tears are there. And then you pick them up and you hug them and then it stops that fast. This type of wailing and howling is not going to stop. In fact, what James is referring to for your miseries that are coming to you, he's actually talking about overwhelming hardship, trouble, suffering, or distress. The word there, and I my, obviously am not a Greek dude, so to lay poria, and Christian, if you got these words, you can correct me. It won't. Um, hurt my feelings. So, miseries. Talaporia. We'll call it that. Overwhelming hardship, trouble, suffering, and distress. This message to non-believers, the word that's used here, is the same condemnation that's given to pagan nations telling them to repent because of their coming misery. What's the coming misery for those who don't repent? Eternal suffering. Where? Lake of fire. But again, these people were somehow associated with the church. They somehow had either some or many people confused or, or, or buying into the fact that they were somehow religious or therefore uh, believers. So James is telling them, hey, listen up. This is what's coming your way. You might as well start crying now. You might as well start wailing now. Okay, this opening that James gives us is pretty bold and he's trying to get their attention. This audience, he's really getting their attention in the next coming verses. He tells them exactly what they're doing in their wealth and their rich verses two through three. Tell James tells us that their wealth was uselessly hoarded. And if you think of hoarding, what, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of hoarding? Aside from the TV show. Holding on to stuff. Has anyone seen the movie, the, the movie, the TV show Hoarding? Hoarders? So if, yeah, you see it and, and you're just like in amazement. How can people live in this, what then turns into filth and rot, but they won't let go of it, right? So in verse 2, James says, your riches are corrupted or rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. So there was three, three things that really kind of measured your uh, wealth back in those days outside of real estate and property and that was your clothes and your uh, gold and silver and then the 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 daily wealth like the food and 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 your your collections that you had the the word here that um, your riches are corrupted is really rotted and it really refers to those food things these folks had so much food that they couldn't even eat it or consume it before it would start to rot what value is that? They're not using what God's given them. It's food going to waste. This, again, is the result of hoarding. You see, if you've seen the show, you see just piles and piles and piles of things that people bought because they think they had to have it and they really couldn't, couldn't use it. Well, gosh, they could have given it to somebody who could have used it. They could have sold it. They could have done something with other with it. But they, they have not. Uh, they have not been using what they, has been given to them. These garments that uh, are talking about, a lot of times this wealth of these garments were heirlooms that were passed down from generation to generation. They were adorned with jewels and different things on them. And so they had value, but they were just stockpiling them. They weren't doing anything with them. So what was happening to these clothes? The moths were eating them away. Why would you invest in feeding moths? They don't need any help with that. 
That's what they were doing. They had amassed so much stuff they couldn't use these clothes. They were just being eaten, feeding the moths. Your, verse 3, your gold and silver are corroded. What's the first thing we know about gold and silver and corroded or rust? It doesn't happen. Gold and silver don't rust. So this, why does this make sense? They do tarnish, however. So there's a couple things that could be going on here. Um, the word katio is to thoroughly and completely rust and corrode. It is very possible that the coins of that day weren't 100% pure. If you in, introduced an impure metal into gold and silver, as if you're making a coin, and you let it sit long enough, that in itself can corrode and rust and make that precious metal now worthless. You can't spend it because you can't identify what it is. It loses, it loses its value. Gold and silver in themselves, those precious metals that are so sought after, they have worth because of their beauty. I get my ring polished about every, I don't know, six months just because I'm really hard on it. And it gets uh, scratched. Well, when it's really when it's br- just off the polishing wheel, it really looks nice because it's all polished. Well, these riches had lost all of that value. Their their um, their the the value of looking at them and the value to use them or spend them. Um, again, the the point of this is that they're sitting there and they're just they're not being used. You have this gold or silver and you're not using it for anything. It's tarnishing. And it's wasting away. It's ha- something that has value, but it has no value because it's not being used. The, something only has value as much as what? Well, something that is, only has value as much as somebody is willing to pay for it. So most of you know that I work on a pawn, at a pawn shop occasionally, and people come in all the time, usually young men who have don't get any, don't want you to feel bad over here, who have just gotten engaged. And they and either the, the the gal said no or it got broken off. And they'll come to us with these receipts from Zales or whatever, from Jared. He went to Jared, and they spend three thousand, five thousand, six thousand, twelve thousand dollars that I've seen people spend on these on this jewelry. How much is this worth? And then we put it on the scale. We put it on the scale and we actually weigh how much gold, how much silver. And it's like, well, you know, you're, you might want to sell this. When I hear Mark or Matt say, you might want to sell this on your own, that means that person does not have what they think they have. Because when you actually weigh the substance of that fine jewelry, there's nothing to it. It's worthless. I've seen as little as $300 offered for a ring that a guy had a receipt for $3,800 that he couldn't return. Because there's just no value to it. But nevertheless, these people are just hoarding, bring, just holding on to this stuff. And then again, it has no, uh, no value whatsoever. Continues on to the verse and it says, And their corrosion will be a witness against you. If you think about, again, that TV show Hoarders, and you see all those things piled up, sometimes you can't even walk into a person's house. That's the witness. You can see it right there, that that person has wasted what they had. They wasted their wealth. Think of it in, in, in uh, maybe you see somebody or you talk to somebody and you look at them and you say, wow, what a waste. They had this. They had an opportunity. Maybe they inherited something. You see a young person who just throws their life away. That's the attitude to hear. Wow, what a waste. You had it. You didn't use it or you didn't use it properly. Uh, it continues on, and you will eat your flesh like fire. Think of this greed that these people had as a poison. And it slowly eats you up from the inside out. Greed will eat you up like that. Slowly like the tarnishing of a gold and silver. You look at it one day, it doesn't look that different than the next day. But you, you bury it away for a while and then you come back a year later and you're like, uh-oh. My, my grandma Krause used to polish the silver once a year. Usually right after she cooked lutefisk. Which was pretty brutal stuff. You ever had lutefisk, anyone? That's that uh, fish soaked in lye, and it's like, yeah, it's pretty bad. But that's when she would polish the silver because she wanted it to, to maintain and look um, looked like it had the value that it had. But this is an eating away. The greed that these people had had it eating away. That corrosion process is slow, but it never, ever stops. It just keeps going. 
at one of the facilities, I work for Louisville MSD, and one of the facilities we have, this is for all of Jefferson County, is the Morse Form and Quality Treatment Plant, Quality Treatment Facility. And that's where all of our waste goes. It's the lowest point in Louisville, by the way, geographically. So everything flows to MSD. There are so much hydrosulfic, uh, hydrochloric sulfur in the air that we have to replace out uh, IT equipment, computer equipment that normally will, in a normal environment, will last five, six, seven years. We replace it every month because anything that's copper in there just gets eaten by this hydro, hydrochloric sulfur that's in the air there. So, and I've done this my first time there. They told me about it. I happen to have two shiny pennies, and I they're sitting up on top of Robin Birch's uh, cabinet up there in the office and every time I go there it took about two and a half weeks and those copper pennies were black and now they just continue you flip them over and you're like okay they still look okay okay I look, went back a couple months later even the side that's down is starting to corrode just because of that acid that's there it really tears up our IT equipment so you can imagine the preventive maintenance we have to do just we just replace stuff because it's just going to go back no it's actually unless you are like snorting the stuff it's not harmful necessarily to humans some people are sensitive to it but for the most part no it's just really tough on metal we don't have metal in us well i have some titanium here and there and more to come soon but um but not that type of metal no or not that time of, is of uh, issue this is also a picture uh eat your flesh like fire of the final judgment and this flesh is that james is referring to is um, plural in that it's a target targeted audience of individuals that he's talking to he's not just talking to an individual he's talking to multiple people again that are in the church somehow claiming to be uh, believers but are not and uh, he's just really laying it at him here aggressively and he's telling them basically you're going to burn in hell this is what your greed is what is sending you to hell and you will burn in hell and there's nothing that's going to stop that you have heaped up treasure in the last days. The last days here is actually referring to a very broad period of time. It's talking about the uh, first appearance between the first appearance, first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ, which means that we're in the middle of that time. So what was going on then is going on now. Do we not see greed in this country? I can go back over the numbers, not, and I'm not saying any of those people, I'm not casting judgment on the 607 billionaires in this country. Because we're going to see, is, that, is, the, is the wealth itself evil? No, it's our attitudes towards that. Um, but the rich in this particular time, and could be applicable today, hoarded their wealth with no consideration for God's plan or God's timing. And if you think of those two things, for God's plan, we'll see later what does God want us to do with our wealth and God's timing. They're hoarding it for a day that may not even they may not even be able to see because we don't know when the Lord's going to return. And when he does return, or when their day is up, what happens to all those riches? For those that have hoarded it. They have no control over it, and it does them zero good. They, they, it has zero value to them because they cannot take it, use it, or do anything with it, especially if they're in the lake of fire, right? Or if they're in eternity. So then we get on to verse 4. Another thing that we learned from James. Again, he first is lashing out at the uh, rich people here, and he's pretty stern. We see that their wealth was uselessly hoarded, and then we get to verse 4, and we find out that their wealth was unjustly gained. Does that sound like it applies to today's society? We could go down a list of those 607 billionaires in the United States, and just by their last name, we know who some of them are. Walton, we know that's associated with Walmart. I'm not saying one thing good bad about that. Mars, there's pebble, several people with the last name Mars. We know who they are. You can go down and down and down the list, and you're just like, hey, I know who this person is. Then there's the ones that their names aren't associated with what they do, but we know the Bezos and the Bill Gates and the, and the others. How did they obtain their wealth? Well, what James, the group that James is talking to here, indeed, the wages of the laborers, their, their wealth was unjustly gained. 
Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, so they already did the work, which you kept back by fraud. That's important there. This, it's not the wealth itself that they have, but it's the attitude with it and the actions they took to obtain it. In this particular point in history, withholding wages, as it it still is today, um, at least in this country, withholding wages was a big deal. You didn't muzzle the oxen. We can think of several Old Testament examples of how when somebody does a job, you need to pay them. Well, you pay them what was agreed upon. So they weren't paying those that had done already done the work. The word indeed, the wages, is uh, probably better um, used is if, if to use the word behold. Like, can you believe what these people did? They withheld wages. It's so shocking in that time that it was like, can you actually believe what you're doing? You're doing the, 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 the worst thing that's possible in laborers, and that's withholding money from them. So their wealth was unjustly gained. And uh, it continues to say, so um, indeed the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And this word, crazo, crazo, is to scream or to shri- it's the shriek of a demon being expelled from its victims. That's how loud and piercing this is. So in, in, in the, the verse continues to say that the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord. God's not deaf to this. Man might be blind to it. Man might not see what's going on. Man might not notice it. Man might be sitting there, hey, I'm going to ride these coattails of this wealth that you've improperly gained, and I'm just going to turn my eye to it because I'm enjoying the ride. But God is not deaf to this. God is seeing exactly what is going on. So God's not going to be fooled with that. So again, James comes out aggressively. He identifies that their wealth was uselessly hoarded. He identifies that their wealth was unjustly gained. Then we get into verse 5, and he says that their wealth was self-indulgently spent. So not only how they made their money was evil, but how they spent their money is evil. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. Now, I like this word luxury and how it's really defined as soft. You have lived the soft life at the expense of others. So it's not that, again, that having a luxurious life or enjoying the finer things of life in itself is evil. But what are we we're supposed to work? We're supposed to work for the things that we uh, gain. And these people live the soft life at the expense of others. So James is really coming after him here. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Uh, I've never slaughtered cattle. But the picture here is cattle will continue to eat and gorge and fatten themselves right up until the moment that they become a steak. And they are somewhat oblivious. I'm looking at Amelia. Have you slaughtered cattle before? And do they know that it's coming? Nope. In fact, they're just happy as can be. And, and, and if you want to lead them, you probably feed them. It's like, come on, let's go. Life is good. You're fattening the calf or fattening the sheep or whatever it was. And then justice is swift and quick, and you can't turn it around. It's done. It's over with. And that's what James is, the picture that he's trying to uh, portray here is that they're just like the cattle. Right up until slaughter, they're fattening themselves. They have no clue what's about to happen, but that justice that happens is quick and it's swift. So then we move on to verse 6. Their wealth was ruthlessly gained. So backing up a little bit again, James, the audience he's talking to, their wealth was uselessly hoarded. Their wealth was ungained, was unjustly gained. Their wealth was self-indulgently spent. And their wealth was ruthlessly gained so far as to they would, were willing to kill for this. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. In their scramble for the wealth, the rich used their influence with the court systems of the day. Sound familiar? Wealth is running our political environment. And again, I'm not making a political statement one way or the other. You don't have to look far to find corruption in our courts, in our legal system. And guess what? The money's behind it. Well, when I was uh, a counterintelligence agent undercover in Central America, uh, this was years ago, uh, one of the things that we did when we were tracking terrorist groups, we followed the money. 
You wanted to know where the corruption was? You followed the money. When you saw money moving, you found out who was behind it. You followed the money. That corruption and money were linked together. Again, that wealth, not in, in itself evil, but the attitude that existed back then, all we had to do was follow the money. When we saw an individual... Uh, start amassing all of her money into her uh, lumber mill and she was no longer producing lumber. This is right at the beginning of the Gulf War. We knew something was going on and there was about 5,000 people down there that weren't doing anything productive, but the money was all going there. They were all waiting there. At this point, they thought that the United States was going to fall drastically to the Republican Guard. And when that happened, they were ready to pounce because of the there was roughly... 3,500 U.S. soldiers there prior to the Gulf War. The Gulf War broke out. They all got deployed to the, to the uh, theater out there, and that left us about 280 U.S. soldiers, most of them with some sort of medical issue or folks like myself that were undercover taking over this entire place. We watched the money. That's where the corruption was. That's where the evil was going to happen. It's not difficult to see. These people were so corrupt in the courtrooms that they had the justice system brought condemnation and even death to innocent men, essentially they would murder to maintain their lifestyle. And the last part of verse 6 says, He does not resist you. The innocent offered no resistance. Why is that? Perhaps they had no chance. They just said, this guy's got me and there's nothing I can do. But when we look at the verbiage that's used here, it's really referring to the innocent, not to an individual but to a class of people, think about that. An entire class of people being silent even though they were being wrongly judged and condemned for something they didn't do. Well, we have the greatest picture of that in Christ alone who was wrongly accused and silently went to the cross for our sins. Interesting analogy there. So as we look at what James is bringing up here again. He is very aggressive in his audience. He identifies that their wealth was uselessly hoarded. Their wealth was unjustly gained. Their wealth was spent on self uh, things. And their wealth was ruthlessly gained, in fact, even to the point of murder. What does that tell us? Does it tell us that money itself is evil? No. What does the Bible say about wealth? There's three things that we should do with our wealth. And again, the things that God gives us. Uh, First, in Luke 16, 9, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Eternal dwellings refers to what? Heaven. We are using our wealth to save the lost. That's one of the things that we should be using our wealth for, is to be saving the lost. John, 1 John three sixteen through 18 This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear, dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. We are to use our wealth to help those who are in need. We know there's people out there that are using that opportunity to wrongly gain wealth. We know that there's people who stand on the corner that, you know, you hear these stories about. They stand on the corner begging for money all day, and then they go get in their car and drive home. And they're really not into that need. But when we see that need, and if we're doing uh, our due diligence with that, we should be helping those people. And if they're wrong, they're not wronging us. They're wronging God, and God's going to hear that. God God sees that. He he knows that. And then lastly, Galatians 6, 6. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. We are to use our wealth to support the ministry. And that's not me. In this case, I'm not saying, okay, hey, I taught this morning, or Stephen taught this morning. Open them up. No, it's the ministry itself. It, it's what we do in our tithes and our offerings for J-Town Bible. It's what we do in the mission field in supporting the Slavic Gospel Mission or we support the Makavas or we support 
uh, the Groves down in Fort Campbell. That's the, those are the ministries that we support, and that's what we are to use our wealth for. We all know what we hear about the, the widow's might, and we think of, oh, she did the most with the least and what she had. And I think her attitude with giving needs to be the same as well. And I think that the whole concept of hoarding can go that way too. Maybe we don't have as much as the billionaires, the 607 billionaires in the United States. But if we're hoarding on to that little nest egg that we have, and we're not willing to support those that need help, we're not willing to further their ministry, we're not willing to do those, do those things with that wealth, we're just as guilty as those that have billions and billions of dollars and won't do it. We're just as guilty. So my challenge for you this morning is when you see in the political arena all this wealth that's floating around, to evaluate yourselves, look at yourselves. What am I doing with the wealth and the blessings that God's given me? Am I doing the right things, and do I have the right attitude? All right, I'm going to close us in prayer for this morning, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the messages that we've had and the word that you give us that we can study and understand how to live uh, in today's world. Even a message about uh, believers and non-believers from um, thousands of years ago can still be relevant in today's uh, culture and society. Give us patience and wisdom as we go out into the workaday world and expose ourselves to those who are lost and give us the opportunity to um, share the gospel with them, whether it be at work or on the street or our neighbors, and just give us the right attitude with the things that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.